This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 402, recorded on August 12th, 2016. This episode is brought to you by CuriosityStream, a subscription streaming service that offers over 1,500 documentaries and nonfiction series from the world's best filmmakers. Get unlimited access starting at just $2.99 a month, and for our audience, the first two months are completely free if you sign up at curiositystream.com slash microbe and use the promo code microbe. This episode is also sponsored by Drobo, a family of safe, expandable, yet simple-to-use storage arrays. Drobos are designed to protect your important data forever. Visit drobo.com to learn more. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me here in New York City, Dixon Depommier. Good afternoon, Vincent. Hello, Dixon. Hello, Vincent. Today is a really, really scorcher. They would hot call this day. one a scorcher. Thirty-three Celsius, sixty-two yeah. percent humidity, very, but very the sun's out and the clouds are pretty. It's uncomfortable. We're supposed to have a lot of storms this weekend. Yeah, there was one last night that actually uh, outdid the Perseid meteor shower. I was watching it off my balcony, and it was northwest of here, and there were absolute classic lightning strikes and you could see the the um, the enormous clouds that were up around 45 or 50,000 feet and you could see all of the cloud it was just like a 4th of July times 10 Did you take some pictures I didn't oh. I was in awe I just stood there in awe Also joining us from North Central Florida Rich Condit Howdy everybody how you doing We're well and you Hello, Rich I'm good You got hot weather uh, we got hot weather, but you know we don't we don't really call it hot. Or I guess they complain <laughs> about it. You know, it's normal, right? It's eighty nine degrees Fahrenheit, thirty uh, what thirty one point six, thirty one point seven centigrade Celsius. So, mm. and you know, partly cloudy. So I've been doing a lot of driving around lately, and I can't tell you how many cars I've seen with Florida license plates. But I have a feeling that they're all so disappointed that they're not back home. Uh, it's cooler where you are than it oh, is okay. where we are. Yeah, fair enough. Also joining us from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. Alan. Alan and Dove. it is blazing hot here. <laughs> blazing, blazing sound. Yes, it's uh, um, temperature's 35 Whoa, Celsius. even more than this. Dew, dew point 23. So. What's your humidity? Uh, let's see. So Unbearable. Dew point at 23. <laughs> humidity is 49%. So it must be because you're inland and we have a little cooling effect of the water here, yes. right? It yeah, I think have... I think you're getting a little bit of a breeze off the water and we are just uh, up here in the hills. But we get a lot of evaporation off the water, which contributes to the humidity during the heat. Yes, so we have 60, right. 62% humidity. Right. And you're also on an urban heat island. We are. Dixon, it says it feels like 41 Celsius. Don't you wish you could capture must, this heat and save it? That's 100 degrees, isn't no, it? No, it is. It is. It yeah, is. we've got heat index here is also 41C, 105 Fahrenheit. What well, it's did 105, we do? 105, 105.8. What the hell did we do before air conditioning? But you know, it's nothing. I know there are people in hotter places... That's and they're true. listening right now, yeah. and they're before, laughing. Before air conditioning, laughing, people right. just left the, the city for the entire <laughs> summer and retreated to the hills. Well, I told my I, we were having a conversation at breakfast this morning, and I said, you know, this the air conditioner has changed forever the pattern of migration of very wealthy people. <laughs> yes, <laughs> because they used to go to places that were cool, like Ireland, for instance. Well, yeah. that's why uh, I'm sure we're going to mention at some point um, that Congress is not in session again until September, and that's the reason for that. Right is that uh, you didn't want to be in the swamp of D.C. in yeah, August. That's true. Could we uh, get rid of that because we really don't need it anymore? There are all kinds of things we could get rid of. Get rid we of don't what, need Congress or the hot weather? We're not going to do it. <laughs> no, why do they have to take the summer off? It's absurd. Take the summer off. And you could get rid of um, a three-month summer vacation at schools, but yep. that's not yep. going to happen either. Yeah, that was for harvesting the crops, right? Correct. Yep. Correct. And now we have indoor vertical farms, so we don't need to we do, do that. We do. That's right. It's all automated. Go to school and harvest the crops at the same time. <laughs> it's in the same <laughs> building. 
My kids never harvested any crops. Uh-uh. <laughs> they were a cropper? Neither did, I, neither did I. Your kids were croppers? <laughs> harvested. All right, we have follow-up. We do. Over on Twitter, there's a fellow named Fake de Pommier. <laughs> he makes like he's you, Dixon. Yeah, well, that's his privilege, I he's guess. Got, he Dick, uses your picture. There are two people who pretend to be Dixon on on uh, Twitter. <laughs> Dixon, you should be flattered that people want to imitate you. Or That's make, what like, they do as they're imitating. Actually, they're quite, they're quite nice, actually. They're good. Today, right. today he said uh, he was busy reading the papers, as he always does. <laughs> oh, and, me? Uh, uh, of course I was. You know, he's making little sarcastic remarks. And then earlier in the week, he said, it's 404, not 401. Yeah, right. Which, uh, and you know, today is episode 402, so we're coming up. <laughs> yep. <laughs> That's right. 404. Yeah, we have, to, uh, Alan, I'm sure, will come up with a title. Well, yes. you know, is it real or is it Memorex? <laughs> you just show how old you are when you say something like that. <laughs> okay. Wink writes, dear professors, I have a minor question about the recent study on mosquito bites enhancing viral replication in the skin. When neutrophils were reported, did that imply neutrophilic granulocytes as opposed to eosinophils or basophils? And does it matter? Hmm. Wink. So I sent this to the first author, Marika, and she wrote, Dear Wink, thank you for your question. Basophils, eosinophils, and neutrophils are all granulocytes, which are characterized by their granules in the cytoplasm. All three cell types develop in the bone marrow from a common precursor, the progranulocyte. However, their function, migration patterns, and the markers they express are actually different. We never actually found significant numbers of basophils or eosinophils in this study. When we reported neutrophils, we identified or depleted these cells based on their high expression of LY6G, which is not as highly expressed by basophils or eosinophils. I hope this is a clear answer. Let me know if you have more questions. May I contribute something to the always discussion? Always, Dixon. You may always. Well, the naming of these uh, cells is based <laughs> on their staining properties with a certain uh, dye. Uh-huh. So the eosinophils are stained with eosin. Right. And the neutrophils are supposed to be not stained because they're neutral in pH, and the basophils are basic. So they take up the blue dyes. So when you look mm-hmm. at them, you've got the color differentiation, and that's the way the uh, histopathology lab uh, at least in the hematology group, that's the way they think about these things. And, and of course, they all do have different functions and in, in homing response differences and things of that Thank sort. You, but that's extremely cool. useful. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. That's and it's good. the uh, right stain or the even the Gimsa stain does that as that's well. That's why it's good to have an, an old codger on the show. <laughs> <laughs> you like that word, don't you? I don't mind it. No. Codger. I don't mind it. And that's why the hematologists sit there with those those five-place yeah, um, right. counter Thing, the counter yeah, microscope and counting right. doing the, the blood count. You know, that's right. Many a life has been saved by those diligent people. <laughs> yes, I spent a summer working in a lab like that. Yeah, well, I spent. Hey, Dixon, you have a laptop there that you can read an email on. Sure. The next one is from Scott. Please read it. I will. <laughs> I know why you want me to read this yes. too, because I've read them before. So it says, "Dear virus gentle people, <laughs> may I suggest comrades?" I've been using it lately, and even my rich capitalist friends don't seem to mind it, and it is getting gender neutral. I may be a bit biased, as I have been gassed on three continents, so it's a good ring to my ears. Thank you for the excellent podcast. My knowledge has vastly increased on subjects I didn't have, but rudimentary science literacy on before. That was rather, okay. Oh, now the part, I know why you want me to read this, of course. I'm an avid fly fisherman like Dixon. But a warning should be issued on how far one wanders down the path, or you will end up in helicopters in British Columbia, floating rivers in Argentina, being chased by bulls in New Zealand, all of which I can attest to. That's a real deal. In the end, it seems about steelhead and permit, but a three-weight on a small stream is still sweet. I I added sweet myself. Run with the hunted. And he listed himself as high trekker. That's a great. That's a great uh, way. So what is three WT? That's a three weight. It's a it's a size of a rod. So the fly mm-hmm. rods are extremely light to begin with, mm-hmm. and they're 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 made according to the weight of the line that you use with them. So it starts from one, although no one ever uses that. It's it's almost not in your hand. You can almost not feel it, and it goes all the way up to twelve weight rods mm-hmm. that are used to catch tarpon, 
which can weigh up to 200 pounds. So you've got these weight classes. It's like looking at a set of Eppendorf pipettes with the different tips, you know, and you've got uh, big ones that hold lots of fluid and then little ones that hold tiny amounts. So what would you go, when you go for trout, what do you use? Well, I, my typical rod is a, is a five weight Winston, eight and a half foot. And I use a five weight line, of course. And, and that's so, sort of a general rod that you can use in most stream situations. But for these tiny little feeder streams that feed into the larger streams, they're, they're more, they require more delicate approaches and a three weight or even a two weight. Mm. With a little tiny fly at the end is a, a treasure. What, what is steelhead? Steelhead is a an anandromous variety of rainbow trout that oh. actually live in fresh water, but they 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 go out into the ocean for a while and yep. feed like crazy, and then they come back about ten yeah. times bigger than they Dixon, were. We should maybe we should do this. We can trout. <laughs> oh, I would love that for fly fishing. Are you, are you kidding? I would just go crazy. I bet we'd get listeners. Oh, I know. Are you kidding? You have more listeners that are out there for fly fish. You'd have David Baltimore as a crossover. I know right. that, and Irving Weissman definitely is a crossover. A lot of people would actually be listening. You're right. And we remember, could, we could get away from the this. Harold, we, we Harold could just Varmus, call it fly. We could just call it fly. No, oh, that would be great. So Harold Vermes is fishing on, with Benny. On our, stop it. <laughs> I don't fish though. <laughs> no, on our 400th show, remember he said when he was offered the yeah, job yeah. out in California, he said, and besides, you can go fly fishing. Right. No, I didn't realize. Someone that. told me who, who listened to the. Uh, episode that he actually wanted to be a fisherman when he was young really? as a profession. Oh, wow. He didn't mention that. That's very interesting. Uh, Rich, do you uh, fish? No. Uh, I did as a child. Yes. Uh, my father was a uh, an avid fly fisherman. Really? Uh, and so, uh, yeah, I fished quite a bit. And uh -huh. I also uh, hunted birds. All right. Oh. Um, but once I left home, I didn't, uh, I yeah. didn't keep it up. All right. Uh -huh. uh, a couple of I mean, he was an outdoorsman, and he took me on some unforgettable trips. Where did you uh, grow up again, Rich? California. Which part? In the San Francisco Bay Area. Yeah, me too. Didn't so, we discuss this once? Uh, yeah, we yeah, probably yeah, did. Yeah. Twiv 92. San Lorenzo. I was from <laughs> San Lorenzo. So one of these trips uh, was actually two uh, on two different occasions. We packed using mules up um, oh, wow. uh, 20 miles out of the Yosemite Valley. Lovely. Um, wow. about 3,000 more feet up and stayed there for two weeks. Neat. Did you catch fished. any golden trout? Uh, I didn't, no, we didn't catch any golden. I, I, it's vague in my memory. I think it was mostly rainbow. Uh-huh. So. Because there's an indigenous species of rainbow trout. It's, it's a derivative of rainbow trout that lives just in the Yosemite area. It's uh, right. A, I have, yes, I have heard of golden trout. It's called Oncorhynchus Agua Bonita. Isn't that a wonderful last name? Agua yeah. Bonita. Agua cool. Bonita. I like that. <laughs> yeah, they're gorgeous fish, too. Alan, can you take the next one, please? Yes. Uh, Rich Kesson writes, Hi, Vincent Dixon and company. Is there any formal evidence that infection with Zika produces enough B and T cell responses to protect a fetus during a post-infection pregnancy? I love these podcasts, and Rich uh, is a professor emeritus of pathology and cell biology at Columbia. He's a good did you, friend of did mine. you know uh, Rich at all, Alan? I did. I um, he didn't. I didn't have him as a teacher or anything, but I, I encountered him a couple of times. I think I may have gone to a talk mm -hmm. of his. He used to work point. on dictyostelium, right? And he also ran a history of science um, right. lecture series, and a, which and had, a, a good friend of mine in graduate school was in his lab, I think. Yeah, he's uh, yeah, eclectic, right. very eclectic. And his yeah. wife worked here as well. So I don't think there's any evidence for this at all. It's a good question. Mm. Uh, whether, you know, you get infected, with, but Zika, you recover, you have, you know, immunity. Then if you get pregnant and then you got infected again, would your fetus be protected? Presumably you would be. That's the basis of immunization, right? Sure. But we don't well, know. But, but we only just figured out that you might want to protect a fetus during a post-infection pregnancy with Zika. So this is all this yeah. is all new territory. I mean, nobody knew last year that um, that this was a pregnancy risk. Right. Uh, it, we it, don't even we don't even really know how durable the immune response is, right? No, no, we don't. Right, that's a good question. And you know, it could be that antibodies may facilitate virus crossing the placenta. Mm. Right, right, could right, be, right. Could be bad, but these things we will find out in the coming year yep. or two, and we will let you know because this is TWIV. <laughs> exactly. All right. Um, Rich Condit, can you take the next one? Basel writes, 
Dear Twivcasters, I enjoyed episode 401, the letter that Ugor wrote addressing incorporating history of science into science classes grabbed my attention. This is because I believe I had the best general virology class ever, which in fact was one of the best courses I have ever taken, and I've taken many. <laughs> this course was led by Dr. Jeru Manning at University of California, Davis. I would highly recommend interviewing Dr. Manning as he has a very interesting background with a PhD in biophysics from UC Berkeley in 1969, being a polio survivor himself. Oh, wow. he, gives hmm. a link to, he gives a link to his um, uh, website. I actually recall he spent the first few lectures talking about history of virology, and I wondered back then when he will actually start telling us about <laughs> virology. <laughs> right. He actually runs us through what experiments were done to discover viruses, filterable agents, what experiments confirmed that they are not toxins, viruses replicate, toxins don't, what experiments were done to delineate if they uh, contained RNA or DNA, if they are single versus double-stranded, all done in a history-telling and exciting narrative format. Mm. The best part I recall vividly, now it's been 12 years and I still remember it, <laughs> how these lectures actually led us naturally to build Baltimore's classification just based on the <laughs> stories that Dr. Manning told us. TWIV itself is charting a new history of science, and I thank you for it. Kind oh, regards. I like that. Oh, I so, like yeah, that very, very nice. much. That's very good. Dixon, how many different genome types? Seven. Very good. <laughs> good job. So uh, Dr. Manning is an emeritus professor, just like you, Dixon. You bet. And, and just like Rich. Hey, yep. let's have him. It does happen. <laughs> Come on. You can't just have him. We'll have the altacacas on. What is that? It's a Jewish term for sages that have exceeded their lifespan <laughs> oh. oh good because i was i was reading a spanish derivation no 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 Mal don't you dare oh no, uh, it's a it's a, a term of endearment yes term you're of very alta caca alta caca <laughs> yeah yeah i know that one Come on. all right the last follow-up or it's not follow-up but hey this we could start in uh no nah, it's follow-up it's fine someone died another person died yep Last time it was uh, Beverly, I forgot Griffin. her name, Griffin. Beverly Griffin. Ten, this time it is Marianne Horzenek, right. and there is an obituary at ProMed Mail, which was sent by Len. Yeah. July 28th, he died at 80 years of age. Hmm. He, uh, he was uh, a virologist, born in Poland, went to East Germany after the war, uh, went to, studied virology in Hanover, Germany, moved to the Netherlands, in 1971, at the age of 35, he became the founding father of veterinary virology in the Netherlands. Oh, wow. From 1992, he was director of Utrecht University's Institute of Veterinary Research. Most of his career spent uh, studying coronaviruses, but also followed outbreaks and expansions of arboviruses, emphasizing the importance of a broad and deep knowledge base across disciplines, entomology, veterinary and medical virology, cell biology, and molecular biology, you need to understand the root causes of these emerging diseases. Mm. Lots of honors and awards. An Lots. eminent scientist whose creative power and constant support were motivating to a large number of supporters and admirers. He implanted enthusiasm for virology research into dozens of young veterinarians and biologists. Mm. Uh, Dixon, did you know him? Sorry, I didn't. <clears throat> but I knew someone I bet that did know him because she works uh, at the National Laboratory what, As a virologist. What's her name? Her name is uh, Yoko van de Giesen. Okay. She worked on flu, yeah. bird flu. Virologists and veterinarians will greatly miss him for his scientific curiosity, inquisitive mind, infectious sense of humor, and his generous and ceaseless support and friendships. The obituary is written by Professor Koopmans, Professor Osterhaus, Rottier, and Lutz, Netherlands and Switzerland. Never met him, but... <clears throat> I know of him. By the way, I've, I've spent a lot of time in Holland, and I am so charmed by that country and their people. <laughs> I have never, ever met anyone with an ugly disposition. They've always had such a wonderful outlook on life because of their surviving through the Second World War under, near, under starvation conditions. Of it. And they've come back strong. They're an inventive country. They've had to put up a lot with uh, environmental 
impacts like uh, a rising sea level, <laughs> etc. And their attitude is absolutely incredible. It's a can-do attitude, and I'm I was always um, anxiously looking forward to my next trip with glee because and and great sense of humor too. They, they've all got good senses of humor. I enjoy it. So another loss. It's too bad because he must have been a, a, an interesting person to know. All right, this just out. Ah. Polio in Nigeria had been Bu- two bummer. years. Polio, no polio for two years in Nigeria, and mm. that had been some accomplishment because they'd had lots and lots of cases over the years, mm. and they got it together. And now, uh, back in July, two cases from the Borno state, and this Which is. is- yeah, heavily just, occupied by a group called Boko Haram oh that you've probably God. heard of in the news. <clears throat> so it's been very difficult to get good immunization coverage. Yes. And uh, these are two kids uh, with acute flaccid paralysis. And um, unfortunately, sequencing of this virus, it's wild type 1 polio. It's first polio type 1 wild type detected in Nigeria since July 2014. And sequencing of the isolates indicate that they are closely related to a strain last isolated in the same place, Borno, in 2011. In other Mm -hmm. words, the virus has been circulating without detection since then. If they had gone another year without polio, WHO would have declared them Mm polio-free. And in fact, you know, so they're saying there's no wild polio in in Nigeria for a couple years, but that's only as good as your surveillance. So obviously they weren't able to get into this area and do proper surveillance, and the virus is circulating in people there. Without causing disease, of course, which can happen. So they're going to go in, of course, and do massive immunizations and so forth. But well, where they can, uh, where they can, yeah. But they don't want it to spread elsewhere, of course. Yeah, and the the problem is that this this terrorist group that occupies that territory is um, uh, unlike a lot of uh, warlord type organizations, which have actually negotiated with health workers to mm-hmm. to come in and vaccinate kids. These these folks just don't. They're the opposite. Um, so there, there are big swaths of territory that are still no-go zones for the vaccination teams, and I, I this this is really bad. Yep, it's unfortunate. So Nigeria now, along with the Pakistan and Afghanistan, uh, we have yet to eradicate wild polio in those countries. It's unfortunate. Yeah, to and me, one of really... the most disturbing things about this is that uh, this uh, same strain. Uh, pops up after two years of nothing yes. yeah you know yes. there's nothing you know another year won't necessarily uh drop it to zero so nope. the the conception of the uh, of uh what eradication actually means needs to be mm, rethought it's only bit. it's only as good as your surveillance right yeah. right we've and all this, been saying this, is this. A, this is basically proving that the surveillance is not adequate to really ensure the virus is not there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in a year they would have said, ah, Nigeria is polio free and maybe the virus would have still been circulating. It would pop up a year later. I mean, yeah, it's a big problem. And so how long has the world been, uh, how long has it been since we've seen a case of type two? Because we've could. It's been, it's been a long time. It's been quite uh, a number of years. Um, 99, I think. Okay. So that's and, a much uh, longer time. It was eradicated, that, le- declared eradicated last year, you know. Yeah, that that one I would feel a little more secure about saying that it's really gone. But this this is just really not good at all. So I have a question that might resonate with our listeners also. And if you were to line up, let's say, the top 20 viral pathogens of humans and after each one list how long can this survive in the wild without humans just sitting in some lake or bog or trash heap or mm. you know water treatment plant how long do do these last and it varies obviously well, of course polio is a fecally transmitted of course, virus so of it course. is quite stable yes and studies have shown that it will sure. persist in the environment for months of course well, now on the other hand hiv is yeah. not terribly stable no. and that's why you need you know sex or blood transfusion and smallpox was easy because it only has one host well so it's polio but you could look Same at the polio, right? you could look at the environment as a reservoir of sorts but if we're talking it lasts about lasts a long time if we're talking about persistence for a couple of years that 
implies to me that it's actually being amplified. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yes, right? okay. It's definitely replicating in people asymptomatically. Yes. Right. And since since you've got, I mean, these these are two cases of acute flaccid per, acute flaccid paralysis. We can assume that there are at least a few hundred. That's right. Infections. Asymptomatic cases. That's right. Go good with point. That. Very good point. One percent uh, symptomatic para- paralytic <sighs> symptoms. That's right. Bless you, Dixon. Um, yeah. So um, it's def- and, and the thing is, if they're using any IPV. In these areas, the, your intestines are, of course, susceptible, so that could allow uh, the virus to replicate and spread. OPV. And, no, IP, <laughs> IPV. If you're using any IPV. Oh, oh, right. I see. If you're using IPV, then you're not um, immunizing you don't have the gut. Yeah. immunity. Mm-hmm. Right. That mm-hmm. strikes me as unlikely. It's most likely they're using OPV, right? Well, so. well uh, you know, WHO has encouraged everyone to start incorporating a dose of... Uh, of IPV, at least IPV2 into the immunization regimen. I would guess probably not yet in Nigeria, but. Well, in one of these articles you've got here, they have a picture of a child being vaccinated against polio in northern Nigeria, and they're getting an injection. Oh, yes. If, that, would be, that, that would be IPV. <laughs> that would be IPV, assuming that that's actually polio. Assuming Who knows? that's accurate, yeah. It could be right. just a stock picture, right? Yeah, right. Good. <laughs> Although, uh, yeah, it's probably correct. And tell me where this district is that Boko Haram is. What part of it? I'll show, I'll show you a map, Dixon. Yeah, would you like, would you like to like see a map? I can click on it right here. Bor- Borno. Right. Borno. Northeastern Nigeria. Northeastern. Here you go. Right. It's it's up near the border. See right with, there? Got it. Near the borders with Niger and Chad. I see. I see. Totally and up, uh, yeah. it's on this lake. It's on Lake Chad. It's if totally may, inaccessible, basically. If I may say so. The upper right hand state. <laughs> Shouldn't be upper right hand, but uh, yes, there you go. Got it. Thank you. All right. Well, we will follow this um, because um, it's important. So we have articles in the Atlantic, Stat, and uh, ProMed Mail, which we'll link to. You can all read and check out. Uh, Before we move on to our Zika sit rep, I want to welcome bacteriophiles to Microbe TV. Mm. Dixon, you know what my bacteriophiles is? No clue. You have no clue. You're totally yeah, I, disconnected. I bet you can. I, I bet you can. You would tell think us. you would go to the website and check it out now and then, but boy, I'm <laughs> so sad. I tell you, I'm really sad. Anyway, we uh, some time ago added audio immunity to Microbe TV. Uh, Dixon, Microbe TV is our website. Did yes, you know yes, that? Yes, I do know that. Thank you. And this week I added Bacteriophiles, which is yeah, a is shorter that? podcast produced by Jesse Knorr. Um, you're like 12, 15 minutes in that length. Hmm. He talks about bacteria, microbes mostly, and he was uh, an earlier, an early uh, correspondent of Twiv years ago, and then he right. decided to start his own podcast. You inspired him. Yeah, and actually we have a letter from him today. I don't know if we'll get to it, but welcome. Check it out, and we'll be yes. putting more shows. I have one more in the uh, pipeline, so to speak, and then if you make a science show or if you know of one that you think should be part of Microbe TV, let us mm. know. Got it. Okay, Zika. Dixon, have you heard of Zika virus? Of course. <laughs> Every day I come into work and I hear about Zika virus because Amy and I have our little sit down just before you get here. <laughs> <laughs> Amy is the uh, scientist in my laboratory working hard. On She's working hard. Extremely hard on Zika virus. She is. All right. Now, the, the main thing here is that there have been a couple more yeah. cases yep. in Florida, uh, but not in the same Winwood area. So. Right, elsewhere, so it's gone elsewhere. Or um, it always was there, and we just didn't know it. Yes, of course, of course. <laughs> um, and I'll, I'll link to a New York Times article uh, that describes exactly where they are. Yep. And uh, so that New York Times article uh, sums the number of cases up to 17 it's, now. Is it 17? As of, uh, when was that? August 8th. When that was published, the, those are all talk the next cases. You're at the, uh, the the last paragraph, yeah, on yeah. Monday on Monday, authorities announced a seventeenth case person in Palm Beach County That's who right. had traveled to Miami Dade. Right. Dear, dear. Yeah, but you know, uh, and the problem is that the uh, the CDC website doesn't <laughs> doesn't not update it. Let's see, <laughs> Florida. Oh, they have sixty. No, that's Travel Associate. Locally acquired. They still show six. <laughs> Why don't they update it? Don't they have someone there that can update it? 
Maybe maybe not. since they didn't get additional funding for this, they took the person who would be updating the website <laughs> and to work on some other aspect of Zika. Maybe. maybe. Yeah. And uh, and that's dated August. It says as of August tenth. Okay, right. So no, it's not updated. Yeah, the Times article was on the ninth. All right, and uh, an article came out this week, uh, which was published in Science: Protective Efficacy of Multiple Vaccine Platforms Against Zika Virus Challenge in Rhesus Monkeys. Right. Three different vaccine platforms. An inactivated virus vaccine, so you grow up Zika virus and you inactivate it, like I, polio IPV. Mm-hmm. A DNA vaccine, a plasmid encoding uh, the glycoproteins, which we talked about last time, or two times ago, or three times ago, three times ago, <laughs> which uh, showed efficacy in mice. And here, same vaccine, same group, they show it protects rhesus monkeys. And then a single-shot recombinant rhesus adenovirus type 52 Vector it, producing the Zika uh, glycoproteins as well, PRM and envelope. Mm. All three uh, induced neutralizing antibodies and completely protected monkeys from Zika virus infection. So, Vincent, how Complete close do you think? Protection. Yeah, I know, I got it. Complete, Dixon. I hear you. No, no living virus was recovered from those people, <laughs> even dead virus. <laughs> now, last time we did say that the uh, uh, NIH is starting a phase one trial of uh, a similar DNA vaccine. In people. And these, yes, phase one would be in people, yes. <laughs> and Fine. these people, did you know of a phase one in my sticks? That's called preclinical. I'm sorry, I'm, you know. You're making fun of me now. I'm your friend. You no, know, you should be kind to Dixon. <laughs> I'm your friend. <laughs> because someday you might need him for something. I need you on, on a daily basis. You'll need him for a phase one trial. That's exactly right. I need you to get my lunch every day. <laughs> Actually, that's not true. That isn't. But I used to know. To I used to know someone who got David Baltimore's lunch all the time. Really? Yeah, he's a well-known scientist now. Um, phase one trials are expected to begin later this year with these uh, candidates. So this is a very exciting. I do want to point out. So the the senior author on this paper is Dan Baruch from Harvard, who hmm. um, was also an author on the uh, the, the DNA vaccine protection of mice, and who. Uh, Alan and I did a podcast with some time ago at Harvard. Remember, Alan? Yes. That was he, we talked about his work on HIV. So, Vincent, right. if wait, this, I'm I'm just I'm about sorry. to get to something. He's winding up to something. Winding up now. Dan is a virologist, and thank goodness, not only do they look at virus uh, growth by RT PCR, but they also <laughs> confirm growth in Vero cells. Now, here is a note to all of you out there who work on Zika, and you have come from other fields. Virology is about infectious viruses. You have to do an infectivity assay. For Zika, it's so bloody easy to do a plaque assay. There's no reason not to do it. If you publish a paper with just RT-PCR, forget it. Forget about it. I'm not going to look at it. I want to see infectious virus, and they do that here. Thank you, Dan Baruch. Thank you, Science. That's just how do, how do you feel about yeah. plaque assays, Vincent? How do you really feel? <laughs> I got a wall full of them. <laughs> I love plaque assays. They are an incredibly informative assay, and they are so easy to do. Right. There is no reason not to do it. Now, I understand if your virus doesn't form a plaque, I'm almost done, Dixon. No, take but let time. me tell you this. Take I, your time, Vincent. A postdoc once came here years ago. He gave a job seminar, and he was working on flu, and he said, plaque assays are too hard, so I developed a, a GFP-based assay. <laughs> and I said, forget it. Do not hire that person. <laughs> That's an absurd excuse. It's not the same thing. Wow, how did I get off on this? I don't know. But I highlighted this sentence where it says, <laughs> We're totally <laughs> impressed. Infectivity was confirmed by growth in Vero cells. Yeah. Okay, uh, Dixon, I'm, I'm so sorry. So two, I have two questions. One is that, <laughs> let's say phase one trials go very well. Nobody gets sick and they can detect antibodies. What's mm-hmm. next? Phase two. Phase yeah, well, no, and I know that's phase two, of course. What is phase two? Well, phase two, you'd want to scale up to a population that has an exposure. Yeah, see if it prevents infection. So I would, I would say, um, you know, you'd go someplace like Puerto Rico. Or Miami-Dade. Yep. <laughs> not, en- well, not enough infection. Not, not enough infection going on yeah. in, in Miami. Or if you, um, if you want to collaborate internationally, um, go to Brazil, right. go to Colombia, mm-hmm. go to some place. So they were talking several thousand to hundred, maybe. Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah, it would be nice. The more, the better. But uh, there you got to see. Hundreds, hundreds, on the other hundreds. hand, by the, time, by the time it comes around to doing a phase two, it may actually be a little too late to go to Brazil or Colombia. 
because um, you need to find a susceptible population. And I think yeah, I was, very, I was thinking very rapidly thing. we're getting to a point where there just aren't going to be enough people who haven't already had this virus. Well, given the trend in Miami, don't you think that's going to increase uh, more? That, well, we talked about that well, last week, Dixon. Were you listening? Yes. It sure was. We decided it wasn't going to spread very much. And yet they found another what, case. What, two more people? Well, that's just... Compared to what they're seeing in Puerto Rico, that's not that much. All right, all right, all right. right. What they're seeing and what they're seeing in South Florida now is no more than what they've seen with uh, dengue in the past. Right. Okay. Where you get these uh, these fair, relatively small outbreaks, and then they burn out. So, uh, okay. I, I do I do want to revisit this. Uh, why it is that this is contained, and we've already talked about. Uh, uh, cultural issues, right? Air conditioning, window screens, mosquito right. control, mm-hmm. basically uh, limiting limiting the spread. Um, why did West Nile get around? Is that because it infects birds? Different mosquito yes. species, totally. Take it away, Dixon. I know it's a different. different I know. No, no, Richard, totally different. Mosquito but birds species. also, Dixon, right? But and it other. also depends on polluted water. We're very good at that. <laughs> <laughs> so it's peri-domestic polluted water. Period. But there's also so I, another so host, I, Dixon. Right? I looked. At I looked this. I, I was anticipating your answer, and yes, I know it's a different mosquito, <laughs> but they have, they have a similar range, do they not? Culex and um, Culex is so much more numerous. Okay, they're everywhere. They're they're called okay. the northern house mosquito. Awesome. Come on. What's, what's another key one? The birds, right? Oh, the birds are can be reservoirs. West Nile virus but, will infect everything. Yeah, we don't have a reservoir in the U.S. for Zika, right. as far as we know, no, right? No. So that's a big no. difference. The other thing right. is we don't know whether it's vertically transmitted into the mosquito or not, do we? I've asked about that before, and hmm. I don't remember the answer. It's I know cool. dengue is not. Okay. Are you sure so, about that? Yeah, I think so. So <laughs> I think so. No, no, no. Very few of them are, but West Nile certainly is. Uh-huh. So that means that you know, next year's brood of mosquitoes can actually contain the virus Without having, I, I have an article here. It says vertical transmission of dengue, Dixon. Yeah, it's probably saying that it doesn't exist. <laughs> Actually, it's in humans. <laughs> We've tra- well, that's different, of course. That's that's trial number three. <laughs> vertical mosquito transmission. Yeah, vertical transmission of mosquitoes. I, there are very few. How important is vertical transmission of mosquitoes for the persistence of dengue? Uh, that's right. no good. Right. Hmm. It's, the question has been asked a lot, and I think that it's, it's yeah. kind of an irrelevant okay. question. I think you're right. It's probably not, not known. The, yeah. All right. Um, so, Rich, in, in short, Culex pipians is found everywhere. There's one right, right, it's found one from, right here. You know, from, let's say, Hudson's Bay in Canada all the way down to where you live. That's why you have that screen around your pool, Rich. And uh, Aedes aegypti is... Very, very restricted to the tropics and subtropics. Okay. Thank you. Welcome. So there, um, you, someone mentioned phase two, right? So Columbia apparently has declared that the outbreak is over. So <laughs> maybe you can't do it there. Yeah, right. But sure, there are some other places. Yeah. Outbreak is, outbreak is over. We've heard that before. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now, in connection with this, um, someone has to pay for these vaccines. Just like, just like we mentioned last time, the NIH <laughs> is doing all these vaccine trials. So there are a number of stories I'll link to uh, about this. Uh, some of them were sent in. One of them, uh, our senator here in New Jersey, Menendez, right, Dixon? Is that our yeah, senator? Yeah, the one that's... He said, Trump. Congress must go back to work to fight Zika. They want them to come back from vacation <clears throat> and give some money. So he's preying on the... No, he should, he's, he's right. They should come back to work and give it. And there's an article today in the Washington Examiner. Health officials say lack of Zika funding will stymie vaccine development. So Tony Fauci says, I'm good until November or December. Then we're uh, starting to get into trouble. He's referring to having money to do these trials. Yep. And Schumer has called for more money, too. It's becoming a political he's a hot exam. potato, huh? Yeah. And uh, well, and uh, so as part of this, people <laughs> have probably seen in the news that uh, Obama announced that $81 million was being made available for Zika funding. Uh, but that's that $81 million is just being shifted around yeah. uh, inside the uh, NIH. Uh, so <laughs> it's uh, uh, I don't know quite what 
uh, right. Thir- Obama has to do with that, but, but no, uh, nothing. The secretary right. who was it, Burwell, right? Burwell, right. She uh, said she shifted it around. She's the well, secretary of health and human services. Yeah, right? there are two two lumps of money. Thirty four million is going from one pocket to another inside NIH, and forty seven million is coming from uh, Bar- Bar- Barda. There you Barda. go, Rich. Barda. Yeah. Right. Um, so Fauci says he's okay till November or December, and given you know what's going on now in politics. Uh, November, by November, uh, December, we'll, right. we'll either have a very obvious resolution of this That's or right. we'll have so much bigger problems to deal with <laughs> that um, Zika will not be the front of anyone's mind. Yeah. We'll have another microcephalic right. to deal with. <laughs> yes. All right, one last news item of interest. The FDA releases final environmental assessment for, their, for Oxitex genetically engineered mosquito. So that means they're approved. That doesn't mean they're approved for commercial use, but they can do release experiments. Is this correct? Am I interpreting this properly? Uh, yeah, they can do tests. And Tell me not- which mosquito they've approved. It's a mosquito which which, uh, which basically the the um, they're engineered so the offspring die before uh, they mature. The males are released, so they're modified. The males are modified. When they mate, the offsprings die. Right. What, offspring what, is this, what is the genus and species of this mosquito? Aedes aegypti. Aedes aegypti. Right. Okay. Aedes aegypti. Okay, great. Yes. Right. So this is, um, this is nippling sterile insect technique updated with genetic engineering. Right. right. Yep. So it's an awesome, powerful, powerful tool. Um, yep. But it's one of those things that once you release it outside of a, a contained area, mm-hmm. uh, you probably won't be able to take it back. <laughs> No. <laughs> well, the advantage, though, is that the mosquito, just like the screw fly, only mates once. They can't yes. be mated twice. So that's an advantage here. Yeah, we'll see. Interesting yeah. stuff. All right. Very any, any other news we should know about, Dixon? Uh, Perseid meteor shower is going to keep going until next week. Yeah. When do we look for it? At night? As soon as the clouds disappear. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be cloudy all week. However, my pick of the week, as you'll see, deals with this. So we'll get to it. Our first sponsor for today is Curiosity Stream, the world's first ad-free nonfiction streaming service with over 1,500 titles. Founded by John Hendricks of Discovery Communications, you will get real science, not reality science. Dixon, you know what a streaming service is? You asked me that the last time, and I, I gave you my answer, but it was related to trout fishing, so I can't. You can, you can cast a three-weight into it. You can cast a three-weight into it, that's right. <laughs> you can get... Uh, <laughs> curiosity stream <laughs> on the web you just open a browser you go to the website you can play uh, also on devices like roku android ios chromecast amazon fire and kindle apple tv you get it in 196 countries and they have a wide variety of science and technology including nature history many more topics interviews they have stephen hawking's universe they have shows on viruses including one on zika virus they have shows like life on us jason silva and Secret Life Underground. I think listeners of this show might like it. Monthly and annual plans available starting at $2.99 a month, which here in New York City is less than a cup of coffee. But it is not less than a ride on the subway, right, Dixon? That's for sure. Slightly more. I think it's two seventy-five. And they also have one of the largest 4K libraries around. That's ultra high definition, so you can see every hair on Dixon's head. Only if you have a retina screen. <laughs> <laughs> Check out curiositystream.com slash microbe. Use the promo code microbe during sign up to get unlimited access to the world's top documentaries and nonfiction series completely free for the first 60 days. It's two entire months free of one of the largest 4K libraries around. Go to curiositystream.com slash microbe. Use the offer code microbe at sign up. We thank Curiosity Stream for their support. Hey, for two months, you know, you can check it out. Absolutely. There's no downside. Uh, it's actually good stuff because it's it truth. It's not That's fiction. Right. Although right. we do need fiction now and then, but not with respect to our science, unless it's science fiction. <laughs> right, Dixon and, and Rich Condit? Yeah, there you go. Rich is a sci-fi <laughs> guy. Fiction, fiction is good as long as it's labeled fiction. It's got to right. be labeled. That's right, not That's science. Right. We have a paper. Hey, get this. A plant virus paper. Yes. This was sent along by Grant McFadden. It was just published yesterday in PLOS Pathogens. It's called A Re- Virus Infection of Plants Alters Pollinator Preference, colon, a payback for susceptible hosts. <laughs> hmm. This comes from 
the University of Cambridge and the University of Bristol, which are both across the pond in the United Kingdom. First author is Simon Grown, and the last author is John Carr. Now, this is all about the volatiles that are emitted by plants uh, and what they do to attract insects. And I have to say that a long time ago, Twiv 70, <laughs> Twiv 70, and Alan must have been there because it was called Hacking Aphid Behavior. Yep. Oh, yeah. Were you there, Dixon? I sure was. I don't know about Rich. Were you? I was there. We talked about how cucumber mosaic virus, which is the subject of this paper, yeah. affects uh, the plant, affects tomatoes, and it alters the emissions, the volatile emissions, to attract the aphids that vector. <laughs> this doesn't <laughs> seem possible. I think it's creationism. <laughs> and then yeah. the it's tool part is the aphids come and they, they drink the sap, right? They they, they poke through and they start drinking and they go, no, this is horrible. This tastes awful. They <laughs> leave, but they've already picked up some viruses yeah. and they spread them. So the, the plant, the virus not only causes these emissions that attract the aphids, but yeah, yeah. makes the plant taste bad as well. It's just I mean, so cool. You the, couldn't, you couldn't make this up. The plots of these, well, you could actually, because I think Greek tra tragedies <laughs> <laughs> play into this a lot because you can see what's coming and you can't stop it. There's no deus ex machina for yeah. this. And so, therefore, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy that benefits who? What? That's a, good, that's a good question. We'll talk about that. That's right. So, in this paper, they're actually looking at the effect of volatiles on bumblebees, which are pollinators. Yes. And in particular, yes. they, they start to look at tomato plants. Um and can I interject here? You can interject any time. Good, because in England, there are <clears throat> tons of greenhouses, mm -hmm. and they're growing lots of different edible plants, and as their chief pollinator, they use bumblebees. So that's mm. it's a very common biology that's familiar with everybody. Dixon. You can uh, talk a lot here, because this is your thing, indoor farming, well, outdoor farming. a little bit, a little bit. You know what's very cool? I got to say this. They can, <laughs> they can artificially pollinate. It's called buzz pollinate. Exactly. They, yes. use, they use a friggin' electric toothbrush. Uh, right. No, that's true. <laughs> what are the true. materials and methods? No, you're right. They say artificial buzz pollination <laughs> was carried out using an electrically actuated toothbrush. Exactly. Of course, that's what I call it, an electrically actuated. Sure. Oral B. I have an oral B. <laughs> that's an oral BB. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, back to the serious science. Right. Uh, tomato, uh, they are actually, they are actually, Self pollinating. They are self -pollinating. But they can but if you pollinate them, if bees pollinate them or you artificially pollinate them, you get a better yield. You get more seeds. More seeds and therefore you get more tomatoes. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> right. And this is called they they uh they aren't actually transferring mechanically pollen from no. uh anthers to stamens. Uh, stamens, but it's called buzz pollination. So they land on the flower. Yeah. Uh, to collect pollen, yeah. and they're <laughs> flapping their wings. They sort and, of strafe uh, it. <laughs> it agitates the surface, and that spreads pollen around. Yeah, exactly right. It's just great. Which is why the toothbrush is a mimic of that. Yeah, yeah. I now will ever always think of that when I brush my teeth. So there is a foot. There is a footnote in this that mm -hmm. the uh, toothbrush doesn't work as well as the bees. Right. By the way, may I suggest that when we end this show, you play the flight of the bumblebee as an outgoing song. Yeah, I could do that <laughs> very good. briefly so we good. don't get into any copyright uh, exactly. DMCA requests, <laughs> exactly. you know. Do you know what DMCA is, Dixon? Never uh, mind. Never mind. Is, uh, Digital Millennium Copyright Act. <laughs> there you go. All right. So uh, bumblebees pollinate tomatoes, so they want to know, and, and tomato is also infected by cucumber mosaic virus. Right. Rich, you want to tell us about CMV? Are sure. You? I looked it up. It's a, <laughs> uh, I had to look it up. <laughs> um, on viral zone, it is a single-stranded positive sense RNA virus with three different segments, mm -hmm. uh, two of which encode replication proteins uh, and a, a sub-RNA of that in this ORF2B, which we will talk about, yep. uh, which is a, uh, an anti-silencing protein. Mm -hmm. uh, and the third segment encodes a movement protein. And uh, the capsid protein, which is translated off of a subgenomic RNA. All right, cucumber mosaic virus. How big is uh, the genome? Jeez, uh, do they say here? They don't give the total size of the genome. 
So RNA1 is 3.4, RNA2 is 2.2, uh, okay. and RNA2 is 3.1. So 10 kb ish. Ish, yeah. Um, and it's uh, icosahedral non enveloped. There you go, Dixon. You see the okay. picture? I do. I see it. Yeah, sure. I've seen it before, but I. So how many proteins does that equal? Well, one, two, three, four, five ish. Five ish. Okay. All right. So uh, they do. They want to know do. CM, so we know already from other studies that CMV changes the volatiles that are produced by infected plants. And we're not talking about cytomegalovirus. We're talking about <laughs> CMV. It, is, it can be confusing. Very good, Jack. Cucumber, so cucumber let's, mosaic. Virus. Let's call it like it is. <laughs> I'm not going to say cucumber over and over. I'm sorry. This Cuc paper is about plant viruses. It's CMV. <laughs> if you come in in the middle and you think it's cytomegalovirus infecting tomatoes. You're going to be very good. Then you haven't listened. <laughs> you better go back to virology. You start wondering which tomatoes you're talking about. <laughs> so they have this cool system for asking whether bees can detect through the volatiles virus infected versus uninfected plants. They encase the tomato plant uh, so that the volatiles can only come out of a little screen on the top yeah. and the bees can't see it. Right. All they can do is smell it or whatever they do. Yeah, yeah. Right? And they actually, and then they, on the top they put a little cup of sucrose, which they can they drink. Give, they give the bees the Pepsi challenge, <laughs> <laughs> and they That's say, right. "Do you like uh, uninfected or infected?" Exactly. And they love infected. They do. That little uh, that little cup, is fact, is an Eppendorf cap, huh. right. right? If you uh, if it you is. look at the it methods, is, and yeah. they they uh, they actually they actually train the bees beforehand to you know they get them used to sucrose so that they like it when they go out there, and the the uh, unattractive um, meal is quinine, so I yes. guess it's yes. bitter. That's right. And they make the point that the bees can't smell this. The only the only can't smell either of these. The only uh, way they can tell the difference is actually by tasting it—the sucrose or the quinine—and they give a they give a reference to that. So I don't know how anybody figured that out. So they're doing like three or four experiments all at the same time, though. I mean. Because they're training bees to well, recognize. Right now, we haven't done any training. I know that, but they are going to. They're going to. On tomatoes, they, they adapt them to the sucrose, put it that right. way. Yeah. Okay. But, so they aren't completely naive to right. Uh, right. having a meal of sucrose when they enter the experiment. But for the right. tomatoes, which are naturally pollinated by uh, bumblebees, they just let them do, they call it free choice. You want infected or uninfected. And they clearly prefer the infected in this. And then they also have uh, plants infected with a mutant of CMV, which lacks the gene for the viral suppressor of uh, RNA interference. Now, in, in plants, RNA interference is an important antiviral system, that the, and these viruses would not be able to replicate unless, unless they could suppress it. So if you take uh -huh. this gene out, the virus doesn't replicate very well. Right. And the bees, they don't, apparently they don't make the right volatiles to attract the bees. So it's interesting. So it's telling you right now that microRNA system of the plant is somehow involved in, you know, regulating the volatiles, and the virus is tapping into that. It's antagonizing some kind of uh, R short RNA interference, and that is involved in producing the the volatiles. Actually, at this point, you don't you don't really know whether it's uh, silencing or microRNAs. Yeah, there's there's it could be both, but it's RNA of, it's RNA interference at some right. level, right? Yeah. Uh, then Dixon, they want to move to Arabidopsis, where you can right. get you can get plants that have had genetic modifications, uh, right? Yep, it's a good yep. plant system. It's the awesome power of plant genetics. Indeed. But bees don't don't uh, land on Arabidopsis, so right. this is no. where they have to train the bees. <laughs> yeah, so Arabidopsis <laughs> is not pollinated by bees. No, right? this is this is a little mustard plant. Yeah, which is used in labs, right? Right, exactly. it's a weed. It's yeah. the Drosophila of plants. <laughs> Dixon it's doesn't like very well. Plants, well said. Very well Dixon doesn't like weed. No, we call well, it look, weeds because guy, they interfere with our crops. I knew a guy who worked on it. He called it a weed. So I know that people who work on it love it. It's eh, it's not a weed. The only weed I heard about in college was well. We won't go there. No, <laughs> you just inhaled, didn't you? I didn't even look. Uh, so they have to they have to train the bees to. Uh, get sensitized to the volatiles. So they right. put, as as Rich said, they either put sucrose. So you say, okay, we have uh, volatile-containing uh, plants. We put sucrose on it and uh, non, and un, sorry, f infected. We put sucrose, uninfected. We put the other. We train them to uh, go to one or the other, which they're going to do based on the volatiles, but then they'll 
they'll associate the volatile with sucrose or quinine, which is the bad tasting right. stuff. So they were trying to alter the behavior. Yeah. Yes. Very good, Dixon. Okay. Yeah, and they the fact that they were able to do this indicates that the bees <laughs> can tell not only infected tomatoes from uninfected tomatoes, but they can also mm-hmm. tell infected Arabidopsis from uninfected Arabidopsis. Right. That's right. right. So, so the Arabidopsis a- has a similar volatiles profile, or, or at least a volatiles profile, that the bees are capable of distinguishing, because once they've trained on this, they are able to associate the quinine with the, um, with the uninfected they do preferentially go to the um, the infected plants at that point, so they are they are able to distinguish them. And how promiscuous is CMV? Uh, well, it's called cucumber mosaic, and it infects. <laughs> yeah, tomatoes, well, that's so why it, I was asking because yeah. well, it infects tomato and tomatoes, cucumbers. It sounds like there's a whole plethora of. Well, let's go to uh, the videotape. You want to go to the videotape? Dixon? Absolutely, absolutely. Let's see the host range here. <laughs> here on here on uh, viral zone, it says natural host plants. Uh, plants. Oh, no, no, <laughs> Vincent. Here's something. It's an angiosperm specific virus. <laughs> Is it? <laughs> yeah. Well, it infects the flowering plants. Well, um, okay. If you say so. So here's a good reason for knowing what an angiosperm is. Let's get so. Steen to tell us. All right. See if we had a chat room. I mean, this must be economically. Yes, it important. is. It's a it's a pathogen of. Uh, Tomatoes and cucumbers. I've seen it come up. It has a wide host range. Yeah. Okay. Here's the here's the site from uh, yeah. uh, agricultural department. Right. Um, USDA. So it, it's a problem of um, of cucumber, but over 1,200 species in over 100 families of monocots and dicots okay. are infected by cucumber mosaic virus. What does that tell you? It's broad host range. And there's no receptor, or if there is, no, there's no receptors. Receptor. No, no, no. There are no receptors. <laughs> they're, they're put in by insect vectors. By the bite yeah. of an insect. By the bite. <laughs> That's right. That's All right, right. So we've trained our bees. They now prefer, clearly prefer infected over uninfected. Yep. And the removal of the viral suppressor of RNA silencing, uh, they don't really like that either. Because again. <laughs> so uh, wait a minute. I want to I want to make sure we got this. Uh, I want to the, make sure we got the experimental setup right. For Arabidopsis, um, the bees don't ordinarily go to them. They're just going for this meal on the top. Which right? they then associate with the volatiles. So you set out a bunch of plants that have, uh, that say are mock infected with sucrose on them and a bunch that are CMV infected that have quinine on them. And you send the bees out. And what you see is that over time, the bees go... Uh, preferentially to the sucrose. Right. So somehow they can distinguish between the mock and the CMV plants, okay? Exactly. Because they will go preferent. They learn that the sucrose is on the plants that smell this way. Bingo. Right? Yes. Yes. Um, and the control, for example, is to just put a bunch of plants out with client quinine or, or sucrose on any of the plants, and the bees don't learn anything. They'll mm-hmm. just go right. randomly to these things. That's okay, right. that's right. Fine. And so you just set up another experiment, and you can set up two different uh, conditions and, and just see if the bees will learn to... You're just asking whether the bees can learn to distinguish between two different plants by yes. putting a reward on top of one and a punishment on top of the other. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, when they, okay. they can't see the... The difference between the sucrose and the right. quinine, they can't smell it. So right. it's it's all on the volatiles. Yeah. Right. So then they can go and use plant mutants to say what's going on here. So, for example, they have a transgenic plant that produces the two this viral suppressor of RNA interference. So it, that alone, that protein alone, in the absence of virus, is enough to attract the bees. So that suppressor of silencing is somehow altering the, uh, you know, the enzymatic structure of the plant so that it will make the volatiles that uh, attract bees. Isn't that cool? Right. So just suppressing silencing is doing that. Uh, they can also, um, so, so this obviously, this uh, VSR is really important in uh, perception of volatiles by these bees. Uh, they also have other genetic, uh, other mutants of the plants. One is a mutant of argonaut protein, this is a component of the uh, RNA-induced silencing complex 
That is when, you know, a short RNA is hitting a target on a viral or cellular RNA. It goes there with a, a nuclease complex, and argonaut is, pro is part of that. So they have plants that lack argonaut, and so that plant is going to be uh, un unable to um, restrict the virus, right? It's, un it's going to be unable to restrict the virus infection. Uh, and so they can distinguish. Let me see if I get this right, because now this is getting a little <laughs> the, bit. This, this, exactly. is really, exactly. this is really tough. They actually summarize this in the discussion. Okay, Go ahead. Because this is a tough point. I'm just going to read it from here, and we'll see if we can parse it out. <laughs> the inability of bees to learn effective to effectively distinguish between volatiles emitted by Argo-1 and DCL-1 mutant plants causes us to conclude that microRNAs are the predominant class of small RNAs involved in regulating the metabolism of bee perceivable compounds. And they go on, and I will go on. So Argo uh, is part of, uh, risk. Part, of, part of risk. It's part of the silencing pathway. Mm -hmm. And DCL1, what was that? That's Dicer. That's, That's what Dicer. chops up the RNAs. It processes uh, the RNA precursors. Uh, right. So, um, so what they're trying to distinguish here is is whether whether this is part of the RNA silencing specific for the virus, or whether it's microRNAs that are uh, uh, causing the change in volatiles. Mm -hmm. So they say the rationale for this conclusion is that Argo one, which is a target of the CMV two B protein utilizes both short interfering RNAs and microRNAs to guide cleavage, mm -hmm. while mm -hmm. DCL1 is involved in microRNA biogenesis, but not involved in the production of short interfering RNAs. Okay, and so, and the bees can't distinguish between those two mutant plants, and what those two mutant plants have in common is microRNAs, or right. the microRNA problem. So that's what leads them to conclude that it's microRNAs. Got it. And not short interfering RNAs. Now let me let me just search do a little more here. Because two B so two B could be acting through either of those mechanisms. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. And that and distinguishing those two now <clears throat> you know that the mechanism uh, appears to be microRNAs. Correct. That that's a really that's a tough one. I had a yes. lot of trouble with that. So they, the, bumblebees, the bumblebees can distinguish between volatiles emitted by wild-type plants versus uh, AGO1 mutant plants and yes. DCL1 mutant plants. Yes. So my guess is that uh, they go uh, – so how do they distinguish? Which one do they prefer, wild-type or AGO1 mutants or DCL1 mutants? Uh, you can't uh, – I don't think you can, from these experiments – uh, detect a preference. Okay, just that they can okay. distinguish. Okay, it's only that they can distinguish, and that's what the difference is with the tomato plants because you're you're you're, you're baiting them with sucrose. Mm. That's what their preference is. Their yeah. preference is I want sucrose. Got it. All right? Okay, so they so can as just a matter of fact, yeah. you can you can take any of these experiments and stick the sucrose or the quinine on the other plant. So right? it's an associated and train, and train learning. The beet. Yes. And yeah, train the bees exactly. to do exactly. the opposite. Okay. But okay. They're, they're doing it by smell, so that's right. the, that's right. the key Smell here. and taste. All you're saying here is that the bees can distinguish between yeah. one plant and another. And another. They don't necessarily prefer they – prefer the, they prefer the smell that's got the sucrose on it. Yeah. Right. right. Yeah. All right? That's but, their only so preference. The main point is that it is um, – it's a microRNA pathway that's involved in generating these volatiles. Right. So – that, right. That's the key yeah, to this experiment. It would be nicer if we knew which volatiles, too. Because well, we're going to get to that next. Gonna okay, to then. So the next experiment, they used um, mass spec gas chromatography right. uh, to figure out what's being emitted by the uninfected or infected tomato plants. Okay? And the bottom line here is that the, the biggest uh, effect, which is not a huge effect, but it's, it's there, um, they have a difference in a couple of terpenoids, terpenoids. all right? In particular, two terpenoids, 2-carine and beta-philandrine. Their levels are lower in virus-infected plants compared to uninfected plants, all right? Now, it's known that other bumblebees are repelled 
by these two terpenoids. So they're wondering if the lower emission of these actually, you know, allows bees to come. Normally they would be repelled by this. So there's the bees see, oh, there's not much of these terpenoids. Let's go eat that plant or let's go <laughs> pollinate and so forth. So they, they think that's what's going on, but obviously um, they have to do more work to, to sort that out. Okay, Dixon. So that's, it's terpenoids apparently that's, uh, you know what a terpenoid is? It's not, yeah. a, it's not a turtle. No, it's a complex organic <laughs> compound, a heterocyclic compound. I believe they're lipids, right? Uh, uh, no, they got, I oh, thought they're, they had some. Uh, they're cholesterol-like. I put a link to that. Where got is it? Weird terpenoids. Chemistries. Terpenoids are a large class of organic compounds, uh, unsaturated. Green units. Yeah, unsaturated molecules. You know what that means, Dixon? Yeah, it doesn't have a lot of hydrogen. Yeah. Um, There's some structures. Derived from yeah, fatty acids. Yeah, it has a resemblance. Yeah, they're not fatty lipids. Acids. Excuse me. They're not lipids. No. But that, that I was thinking of the unsaturated. That's why lipid right, came right, to my head. Right, right. Anyway, so it looks like iso. Uh, but you can uh, smell them. You can involved. smell them. What do they smell like, Dixon? Uh, that's right. What do they smell? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Open the can of turpentine and you'll find out. <laughs> Yeah. Are you serious? Are I'm very serious. No, terpen terpenoids and okay. turpentine. They're I know what they smell linked. like. All right. Now they, they say, what's going on with, um, why, why are bees being attracted by virus infection? So uh, the first thing that they, they look at is um, seed production. They find that virus infection, CMV infection inhibits <clears throat> seed production in the tomato. All right. Infected versus an uninfected plant, let fewer seeds are produced. And you can rescue that by artificial pollination of the plants. And here we can use our electric toothbrush <laughs> to do that. Or uh, you can allow bees to go and they will correct for the lower seed production caused by virus infection, right? So this is very interesting. Um, virus infection has a detrimental effect on seed production. However, you think that's, I'm sorry. It, it recruits bumblebees by putting out these volatiles, which then help uh, correct the, the defect. Bumblebees buzz the plants, and that allows them to catch up on seed production. Yeah. So you can't say that the virus infection uh, comes at a cost with regards to energetics or the availability of substrates or things of this sort because it's correctable. Well, at least that one property is, right? Yeah, but I mean, seeds... Right. But that's important, yeah. That's what it's Plants about. will do anything to make seeds, no matter what. So that's their prime goal and so finding something that inhibits that is really quite curious why why would you what do you think the evolutionary significance of a virus inhibiting seed production in a plant that's its host means because that's lowering the number of hosts basically well right um and therefore there'd be a powerful selective pressure on the virus to either not inhibit seed production or somehow compensate for the inhibition of seed production by attracting bees which by attracting bees that yeah, compensate for example i hear that okay. so, okay, you, so can, you can imagine that at one time the virus did not attract bees uh, but one a mutant arose that was able to do that and it had a powerful selection for that right because it allows you to make more seeds so now you get or it could be a plant that arose that in response so to nobody loses and, under those conditions. It uh, attracts bumblebees. It doesn't have to be the virus. It could be the plant that you Yeah, there's no right. loss. I mean, you get viruses, you get your yeah. bees pollinating, and you get your flowering plants reproducing. I mean, so one of the things that they, they do, they model, they, the last experiment is a modeling experiment, which would say, <laughs> if this is true, right. if, if it's true that, you know, the virus attracts bees, which uh, increases seed yield, would this mean that you never get any resistance any resistant plants, because uh -huh. that would be bad for the plant, right? So they model a number of scenarios where they look at, uh -huh. you know, pollination versus, um, they call it pollinating surface versus whether you would get resistant or not. And they say basically over a wide range of conditions, you would uh, maintain some susceptible plants in the population for uh, no matter how, uh, any of the variables that you look like, which include uh, pollinator, uh, visits, um, the visits per flower, uh, pollinator bias, and so forth. And go, they went through a whole range of different conditions. In the end, there's always going to be some susceptible plants because they're the ones that are making the most seeds. So that's kind of interesting. But it's not true. Uh, this is It's not that nobody loses um, because a plant 
that could evolve the ability to be as attractive to bees without being infected would have all the advantages. Right. But that hasn't happened, right? That hasn't happened. Yeah. So, so there must be, it may, it may not be compatible with plant life, or at least tomato plant life, right? Who knows? Well, you know, it's all relative. These plants are evolving to, <laughs> they're, they're to attract bees all the time, you know, mm. and this, uh, the virus is just a, it's just a spin on this whole thing. It's a, uh, it's a, it's another theme. But these, so, I'm sorry. So the virus actually hurts these plants. They, they're smaller. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. Uh, they have fewer seeds, though. Uh, interestingly, they flower earlier, and that may be <laughs> uh, a bit of an advantage. But in general, uh, without the you know without the B factor, the virus is really hurting the recapa- uh, reproductive capacity of these uh, plants. But that appears to be compensated for by the fact that the bees are attracted to the. Uh, virus infected plants because of this microRNA thing that's uh, because of this 2B protein that's tweaking the microRNAs, which is tweaking the terpenoids. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. And it's because of their buzz pollination that it compensates for the deleterious effects of the virus infection and maybe sufficiently uh, so that you can maintain a pop- population, uh, according to their modeling, of, of virus susceptible plants. That's right. Amazing. But it Dixon is. raised an important point. What's that? These Which are you, domesticated plants. These are domesticated plants. Mm-hmm. I mean, really domesticated plants. These you'd call these plants on a leash. If you looked at the wild type of these plants, you wouldn't recognize them. So, how does this work in nature? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so, these are commercial crops that are affected because monocultures are yeah. highly susceptible to lots of things, right? That's a good uh, point. So, can you find wild tomatoes? Well, you can go back to the ancestral uh, plants that gave rise to the tomatoes. Those are still around, but they don't look anything like a tomato, I can tell you that. Uh, that would be an interesting thing to study, though. It sure yeah. would be, because bees it's, in nature man, may, maintain biodiversity mm-hmm. through pollination of various species of plants. So these ancestors and, of tomatoes, Dixon, are they I pollinated by bumblebees? Don't know. I have no mm-hmm. clue. They're in, they're in um, Peru. Central America or Peru. Yeah, yeah they're from Peru, yeah. I would bet that this uh, emission pattern doesn't happen in those in those well, ancestors. It, it probably evolved during the mono cultivation. Yeah, yeah, I I think you're right. But that could be wrong. It would be interesting to look at that. That for sure. Absolutely. I wonder if they are. Maybe anyway, it's a cool example it's, it's of great. They they bring up the point I, that I we have to stop uh, looking at viruses as all pathogenic. <laughs> that we should look at them as symbionts. Yeah, and they right. vary. They have a spectrum from parasitic to mutualistic in this symbiotic range. So some yeah. are parasitic, and they hurt us, and others are good. And they mention, and and I heard actually uh, Marilyn Rusing talk about this. Some viruses confer drought resistance to plants. Mm-hmm. About that, right? So there you go. The plant, the virus has a place to replicate. The plant lives. It's kind of an interesting That'd idea. There are lots of examples of of beneficial plant viruses. Yeah, remember the grass. Uh, that grows at high temperatures in Yellowstone. A virus and a fungus helps it grow at the high temperatures. So, a lot of cool things. Yeah. Anyway, it's a cool paper. Yeah. Thank you, Grant. And yes. complicated Is experimental complicated? setups. I mean, you have three different things to keep track of all at the same time, at least, and maybe more. It's a bit complicated. It's a kind of you, you got to look at it carefully before you can wrap your head around it, as they say. Exactly. Right. But, it can but because be done. it's in PLOS Pathogens, you can go read the paper yourself. Uh, so, yeah, go check it and out. And I, I deeply appreciate Richard's take on it because <laughs> otherwise I would have missed that point uh, that you read so eloquently from the discussion. So thank you. Well, uh, I, you know, it was that's a tough part of the paper is how they yes. distinguish yeah, yeah, yeah. How, the, how they distinguish between micro RNAs and and silencing RNAs. So that's, right. that's something I wanted to mention. So this viral suppressor of silencing. It antagonizes the plant's uh, RNAi defenses so it can replicate, but it's also somehow <laughs> changing the metabolism of the plant so it makes these volatiles, right? Because yeah. an unaffected right. plant has a twofold uh, function. It's really cool. And presume, presumably, it's doing that, changing the volatiles by tweaking the microRNAs. Mm. Exactly, okay? exactly. Yes. Because remember, this, I, this RNA suppressor of silencing. Um, it binds small RNAs. That's in part how it works, right? Right. And also binds Argo, mm-hmm. apparently. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. Nice paper. Thank you, Grant. This episode is also brought to you by Drobo. Welcome back, Drobo. 
It's like welcome back, Cotter, right, Dixon? <laughs> yes. George Drobo makes storage arrays. They make a family of devices to protect your computer data. They have systems that connect directly to your computer. It can be a PC or a Mac, or as my son tells me, Dad, they're all PCs. One is Windows, one is Mac OS. <laughs> okay. Your son happens to be correct. Yeah, it's tough when your son is correct. <laughs> don't you just hate it? <laughs> no, I don't hate it. It's fine. I'm glad they're growing up. Um, via USB 3, Thunderbolt 1 or 2. They also have network storage devices. You can hook them up to a network. Hmm. Now, in 2008, Drobo invented the concept of exposing the server that's embedded in their network attached storage devices to developers. They said, here, take the API, take this and write programs. So they have a Drobo apps program and developers can write things to modify the use of the Drobo. It's very cool. So you can write apps. There are four categories of apps uh, that you can write on cloud apps that let you back up to two different cloud services or get remote access or sync to other computers. Um, developer functionality, tools for developer who want to program or develop website. There's a full LAMP stack and Node.js. Also WordPress for web developers. You can use C, Go, Perl, Python, or Ruby to do this. And there's a software development kit available to support programming. Home entertainment a program called Plex allows streaming your media to your computers or devices, and these can be integrated with the Drobo. And finally, me media collection, tools like a BitTorrent client for gathering files from different places on the internet, even email. You can run your own email server. So developers can do things in a very, very creative way to utilize uh, these Drobers, these Drobos. And the networked attached versions have remote, secure remote access with end-to-end -end encryption. Models 5N and 810N are network storage systems, and they're very secure. And the Draps can, the Drobo apps, sorry, I'm talking too quickly, the Drobo <laughs> apps uh, can be installed when the developers write them, and, and they can allow you to do various things as well. Next time we talk about Drobo, we'll tell you how uh, my Drobo and Drobo Access uh, work. I got a Drobo N. Um, Alan has a Drobo 5N as well, right? My my yep. goal is to in integrate it into my laboratory because we want to share our data. And you have, have already put it in your house, and you can access your data all over your house, basically, right? Yes. So I've got the drive on the network, and I could uh, – um you know, access it from any computer. I haven't really taken huge advantage of that. Mainly, it's a backup device, but mm -hmm. uh, a lot of a lot of possibilities it there. It works too. It's so easy to computer. use; even a caveman can do it. Like That's you, me. Yes, I have one too. <laughs> so I so the the way it was work at home a Drobo Five N, which is a network attached storage. You would plug it into your router with an Ethernet cable. It would automatically get an IP address from your router, and then it would be visible on your little local network. Now, right. here at Columbia, we don't have routers that we can plug things into. We have ports on the wall, and you have to get every device you want to put into the network registered. So I can't simply plug my Drobo in. Well, I could, but it doesn't do anything. So I have to give it an IP address first. Mm -hmm. So I will tell you how that goes. So I think for a lab, it's an interesting use case. So I'm going to try and set it up and tell you how it works and, and how I use it. Now, listeners of the uh, Microbe TV podcasts, including TWIV, can save $100 off a purchase of a Drobo Mini 5T 5N or any 8 or 12 drive systems. They make Drobos with up to 12 bays. And what, what is the capacity of a hard drive now? Four terabytes? Maybe the, more? You can get bigger ones, but that's, yeah. You, Let's you say can certainly four, pick up a four terabyte. Four times 12? <clears throat> wow. That's a lot of terabytes. Now you would um, you'd end up with uh, because it's a RAID array, it, it duplicates the data. So in order to really take advantage of it, you wouldn't get the whole yeah. um, the whole forty eight terabytes. You might only have twenty four terabytes, but still, that's a whole lot of data. Would show up on your desktop as a single drive. Single drive. <laughs> it's very cool. Hundred dollars off. Go to drobostore dot com and use the discount code microbe one hundred. We thank Drobo for their support. Of Twiv. Let's do some email. First one is from Kevin, who writes, I'm an organic chemist who sometimes enjoys listening to your show. 
sometimes. I'm so sorry that it's not all the time. <laughs> In the recent episode where you were having a discussion with Stuart Firestein, you mentioned the notion of doing a director's cut of a paper. This brought to mind the sort of thing that Phil Baran, a well-known organic chemist with a bent towards total synthesis projects, does. Often people from his lab will post on their lab's blog discussing the behind-the-scenes details that are often absent from the formal publication, the post concerning their recent paper in Nature, and even includes a YouTube video of the lab's PI suiting up and going to the fume hood, then running the reaction discussed in the paper, which was interesting and slightly amusing. Your mileage may vary. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea whether investigators in the virology, molecular biology field are doing anything like this, but it seems like a good example to follow. Perhaps other listeners could cite examples if any exist. I think this is great. I went and looked at it. It's really cool. The blog posts are neat. They explain sort of the behind the scenes. Uh, I do think people should do this. Did of you course, find the Did you find the YouTube video? Because I looked through this blog post. I didn't find I, it. Okay. Couldn't find it. Couldn't find right. it. No. <laughs> well, I wanted to see it, but uh, I, you know, a lot of people don't want to do this until the paper's published. Obviously, but right. once it's published, right. uh, you can do it. You know, it's all out there. So. Check it out. Now, there have been some journals that yeah. uh, have published little videos yeah, that sure. went along with the journal. Paper that Flick. Gives, paper Flick that gives yeah. a little bit of an inside story. I forget which uh, journals. I think these it's are. Cell. These are El Sevier, Cell in particular. Yeah. Well, yeah, there's, also, there's also Jove, the Journal of Visualized Experiments, which specializes in publishing videos. Yep. Uh, yeah, but they are uh, incredibly boring. I mean, you know. <laughs> if, if you don't need to do that particular technique, then yes, those are they tend to be very dull. Yeah, I mean, they they this is the, they're not. Yeah, they're videos. And as a matter of fact, it may have been Jove, where I found the video of how to rear mosquitoes. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah right, uh, right. I'm, I'm not. I, that may not have been Jove. I'm not sure. At any rate, uh, they're they're not made to be entertaining. On Jove. No. No, they're, they're, those are, Jove are made to be, they're to show to. you how to do the technique. Right, right. Well, not too long ago, I put out a virus watch uh, where I filmed uh, Amy in my lab doing a plaque assay, okay, mm -hmm. and we and explain how it works. So that's a, sort of the same idea, and I hope to do more of those. Um, plaque assay is particularly well-suited to that because uh, it's very colorful Perfect. and yeah. visual and so forth. But, yeah, I encourage people to do that. Dixon, can you read the next one, please? Certainly. Solar Keen writes, keep twiving, guys. And notice he says, guys, <clears throat> you've got a lot of listeners from Nigeria, especially Ibadan City in the southwestern part. Hope you've hope you've had or planning to twiv on K9 Parvo CPV2. I am thrilled about the SS DNA and the mutation rate. Hmm. Uh, southwestern part. So he, he is as far as you can get away from from the polio. Yes. Polio. Actually, this, this, <laughs> the story that single-stranded DNA viruses have a higher mutation rate is very interesting, and I do want to have someone on in the future. So we will do that. Hmm. Thank you. And hmm. glad to hear that you're listening in Nigeria. You want to take the next one, Dixon, since it was short? Um, sure. Okay, Nicholas writes, Dear Twiv team, love the show. Recently came across it when looking for a way to brush up on my virology. Thank you very much for your YouTube lecture, Professor, professor Reckoniello. Here are a few humble thoughts from me. On the dolphins did it, you compared hand-drying methods. What you didn't mention, however, and baffles me, is that in the 21st century, you often still find yourself washing your hands carefully, only to then have to touch things like the tap or the door handle, rendering all those efforts useless. So I stopped there. I got to... I agree so much, <laughs> and I always try I totally and not touch the, the handle. Sometimes in stations, there are no doors, so it doesn't matter, right? Uh, but yeah. if there is a handle, I try and push the door with my elbow. Or What do you what do? You do? do you do anything or you don't? I use the paper towels. <laughs> and then you yeah. throw it away. Yeah. Seriously, I take the, I take, there's usually a trash can next to the uh, door. I'll take the paper towels in my hand, and I will turn the doorknob with the paper towels and then throw the paper towels away as I go out the door. Good yeah. idea. What about you, Rich? I I don't care. <laughs> I really don't. Well, I, if, I figure, I figure, you know, microbes are good for me, and I just, <laughs> you know, I just take the easy way out, and I'm still alive. As a matter of fact, I'm quite healthy. Um, there you and go. I wonder if there are actually any studies that uh, verify that uh, touching the tap or the door handle 
uh, in the words of, uh, who is it? Um, Solar Keen, no, Nicholas, in the words of Nicholas, uh, renders all the effort useless. Has anybody ever I'm sure. Is, I'm sure. done there, that? Yeah, oh, there's Richard. certainly a lot of data showing that you find a lot of E. coli at all on the door handle you do. compared yeah. to other surfaces. But it's usually the kind that doesn't make you sick, so the answer is... Well, but that's an indicator that there's fecal uh, contamination. Got it, around. got it, got it, got it. But um, the fact that the handles are made out of metal and they have some kind of an yes. effect on the microbe survivability, so that's probably why it doesn't result in epidemics in hospitals, for instance. I do notice that in, place, in a lot of public places, in particular airports, you can get through the whole thing without touching anything. That's correct. Yes. That's right? Correct. They got the... Uh, you know, yep. uh, activated, uh, light activated, right? Everything, towel dispensers and the Dyson faucets, blade. and there's yep. uh, no no doors. You know, it's just a the Dyson a blade is aerosolizes everything, and puts it in the air, puts it on the wall, puts it on your face. <laughs> it yeah. has the opposite effect. Actually, of someone on uh, Trudy on Twitter. Uh, put a picture of one of those Dysons, and she said, "Whenever I use one of these, I think of Twiv now." Yes, <laughs> you know it's it's true. But you know what? Rich is right. You got a good immune system. You've lived a healthy life. It probably not right, but get look, sick. You know, train stations, airports, a lot of traffic. Could you could have cholera on that door handle? Oh, no, I know. You know, you could get it. Cholera doesn't survive very well, by the way. That was a bad pick. What if the person before just how about touched multiple it drug resistant tuberculosis? Fixes. That's just, what if the person before. Ten seconds before, you know, had fecal mm -hmm. contamination, yeah. put cholera there, and then you picked it up and you touched your mouth going out, yep. you're infected. You're doomed. <laughs> <laughs> or e heck, you know. Yeah, all right. Those. all right, right, there's more to this ahead. letter. Go ahead. All right. On all right. Quaxed, a few thoughts. You probably know all about this better than me, but as far as I'm aware, the anti-vaccine scare is fueled by multiple causes, making it so hard to fight. Point in case. Case in point, <clears throat> evil pharmaceutical companies are just trying to poison us in order to make money. While I doubt the first, the second is certainly true. Unfortunately, sometimes to an extent that only leads to damaging the reputation of the pharmaceutical industry. Vivid examples are Martin Shkreli and, mm -hmm. and SmithKline Glaxo's uh, Paroxetine. I don't know the example. Not helping. Second point, suppose Supposed doctors using a mixture of fact and fiction to convince people that, for example, the danger of Zika is all made up. The, and he gives a quote, the truth behind the Zika virus by Bergman, right next to Vincent's Virus Watch Zika edition for <laughs> 2916. This is then followed by luring them to the obvious cure. And Prince, 97% effective for all diseases available from that person for just a few hundred dollars and not at all hocus pocus. Oh, well, it's chiropractic, he says. <laughs> then final point, a variety of psychological effects like the availability cascade, con confirmation bias, the frequency illusion. The book, You Are Not So Smart, was quite the eye-opener for me a few years back. I now regard information even more critically than before, including my own memory and reasoning, <laughs> not to mention newspaper <laughs> articles. <laughs> This also leads to, in parens, for me, horrifying results like up to 56% of people between 30 and 50 believing in homeopathy in Central Europe, according to a study, if you don't believe it. Same goes for anti-vaccines. Kudos to Nina for fighting it. I have already, I already have my hands full with my own family. <laughs> Lastly, a video that I find very useful since it makes Zika understandable for non-scientists, and he gives a link. And so he says, best regards. That was a nice letter. Keep going. Uh, then he's got more, right? And he says, recently of New York, slowly come to, to terms with the infernal imperial measurement system and the <laughs> clapping interruption, erupting operas. <laughs> they don't like clapping in you know, an opera, but, uh, but that is a different story. P.S. When will we, they finally stop poisoning us with dihydrogen monoxide? Huh? Dihydrogen monoxide. Dihydrogen monoxide. 
What you know the who H- that is? H2O. H2O, Dixon. <laughs> it, it dissolves that is not the way I would have said it. <laughs> it, it, it no, this, this has been That's right, subject right. several. several it's wonderful. Dihydrogen. I mean, it, his point here is that, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you have to pay attention. If you say course. it a certain way, you're going to get fooled. If you go to the yeah. first article, dhmo.org facts, and start reading it, you go, holy <laughs> crap, what is this? Yeah, right, 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 right. But you it's know? water. It just goes to show that a lot of people will not pay much attention, right. and they'll say, oh, this is really bad. When heated, it causes a scalding vapor. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> you know, and when uh, submerged in it, you might drown. <laughs> it, it kills many people every year. It does. Yes. It does. It does. I think there's there's a sign, I think, at the wiki site. It says, danger, <laughs> hydrogen present, and there's a water... <laughs> <laughs> is a water you know it's a water tank danger yeah, hydrogen yeah, present yeah, 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 yeah. that's just great yeah. so this video uh, that he linked to is wonderful it's i'm so good. i'm so jealous it's so well done this is what i'm trying to do with <laughs> right. virus watch it's right. a whiteboard video or a, a tablet yeah, and they're yeah. just wonderful artists and they write it's just, it's really well done she I'm, I'm really <laughs> i have to aspire to that now the thing is i notice when i go to see my videos that i make you know, I get a thousand or two thousand views, and then right next to it is the <laughs> truth behind Zika. Millions of views. Right. Oh my gosh! <laughs> right. People want uh, conspiracy. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. So it's interesting when I looked at this uh, this link that he has here. The truth behind Zika came up behind that. Mm. So YouTube must uh, channel stuff uh, based on keywords that you use and yes. the number of hits that it gets. Right. Yes, yes they do. So, which means the science and the pseudoscience end up right next to each other. Sure. Yeah, right. Funny. The best take on You Can Fool the People some of the time was uh, Al Cap recounting a um, a test of people's gullibility by the fact that they don't understand words. He put up a big sign with a table and a collection pot at the Detroit airport, and it said, please help the affluent children of Gross Point, Michigan. He said he raised hundreds of dollars in a couple of hours. <laughs> wow. So... so uh- you know, you have to read carefully to understand what's going on here. And so I'm sorry that I misread that, but I, I misread it probably innocently. That's, that's uh, Alan, Alan, do you know what this uh, 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 Glax, uh, Glasgow Smith Klein paroxetine? I'm not is- sure what the issue is there. It's an SSRI. It's an antidepressant um, uh, that is widely prescribed, and I don't know. I, I, there are so many pharma scandals these days that I've I have lost mm-hmm. track of what that one was supposed to be uh, about. and is anybody familiar with this uh, book you are not so smart no no so the, the u.s department of justice fined GlaxoSmithKline three billion dollars in 2012 Ouch. for withholding data on parox oh, uh, oh yes three this one. billion right. dollars yeah unlawfully right. promoting it for under 18 year olds good yes right yes. good heavens that's really which they promptly paid <laughs> probably still fighting it without batting an eyelash i don't so know this, the, you, this you, book in, this book you are not so smart yeah. is by david mcraney or mcraney and it's it's you are not so smart colon why you have too many friends on facebook why your memory is mostly <laughs> fiction and 46 under uh 46 other ways you're deluding yourself <laughs> okay. i'm not surprised well, if you do do a hydrogen monoxide, you can dilute yourself every time you take <laughs> it. I mean, I mean, come on. <laughs> uh, let's do one more, uh, Rich. Huh. Okay, Jesse writes, Dear Wonder Twivs, <laughs> you talked in Twiv 345 about an association between one version of the pandemic flu vaccine and cases of narcolepsy. But there's been some recent research and happenings that made me think you might want to give an update on the issue. If you have already done so, though, and I missed it, disregard this message. For one, the paper you discussed in that episode from Science Translational Medicine has been retracted Mm. because the authors couldn't reproduce the findings. Secondly, another paper has come out recently that did not find a real association between narcolepsy and the vaccine. And he gives the, uh, it's no evidence for disease history as a risk factor for narcolepsy after uh, uh, H1N1 pandemic strain 2009 vaccination. And gives a link to the PLOS One article. Mm. Seems like something worth me- mentioning. Keep up mm. the great podcasting, Jesse. So back on TWIV, uh, I forgot the number. Not too long ago, we talked about a paper 
It was called, it was TWIV uh, 345, how a vaccine got the nod. We talked about a paper in Science Translational Medicine, antibodies to influenza nuclear protein cross-react with human hypocretin receptor 2. And we were very excited about that. We were. Because we thought that would explain uh, narcolepsy. But it turned out to be a real sleeper. (laughs) Now, the paper that Jesse refers to is not the same paper, but it was uh, published a year earlier. And it says uh, CD4 T cell autoimmunity to hypocretin and cross reactivity to H1N1 and narco- narcolepsy. That was retracted. So I think Diff- different it, group, different group, but I think it's the same idea basically that this cross reactivity between hypocretin and uh, an epitope in, in influenza A virus 2009 H1N1. Mm-hmm. So that that's the one that's been retracted. But you know the, the original one that we discussed is probably wrong also. So that's that. Or maybe it's, I'm not sure I'd say probably wrong, but it certainly calls into question. Um, I mean, the, the retraction is because they couldn't find any um, cross-reactivity. <laughs> they couldn't reproduce the cross-reactivity between. Yeah, it's not It's not because of funny business, I don't think. It's because they, they, reproduce it, yeah. they couldn't reproduce it when they were trying to follow up on the experiment. So it's, uh, I guess if there is such a thing, it's a good retraction. So the ba- basically what they say, uh, we have been unable to reproduce the key findings. We can't demonstrate a differential uh, ELISA response of CD4 positive T cells from patients with narcolepsy compared to those from normal controls after exposure to the hypocretin peptides. So they retracted the article. Uh, and of so course, when, when was that? That was 2014, a year before the article that we talked about. Hmm. And huh. in both cases, they're talking about a cross reactivity uh, between, you know, hypocretin and influenza. Does the article so, that we were talking about refer back to this article? Yeah, it does. It does. Okay. Well, I wouldn't necessarily, uh, you know, throw out the one that we discussed. I think time will tell, right? Science yes. is self-correcting. We'll see yeah, what yeah, happens. That's right. That's right. That is right. Yeah, our, and this- our paper, which was a year later, exactly a year later, was all about cross reactivity between influenza nuclear protein and hypocretin receptor too. Receptor, not hypocretin. Is that right. is that a difference? Ah, let me ah. let me see if that's a difference here. Uh, patients normal after. Yeah, I think it's the receptor as well. No, it says hypocretin, hypocretin peptide. So it's different. It's hypocretin, not the receptor. So it could be that the second paper is correct. All right, they haven't retracted it. It's just that <laughs> right. first not observation. Right. Now the the paper that he sent us, which is a plus one paper, no evidence. For for disease history as a risk factor for narcolepsy after H1N1 vaccination. It doesn't exclude vaccination. It just excludes disease history in these patients. Right. Mm-hmm. There's no particular disease history that's associated with narcolepsy. So it doesn't take the um, spotlight off the vaccine. And right. it doesn't take the spotlight off hypocretin. Correct. So this really doesn't speak to that paper at all that no. paper that we did uh, no it doesn't right the paper it's we did is still out there and there's it hasn't and been it's, retracted. it's a different one st- yeah. still appears to be sound as far as we know um but anyway thanks for pointing that out yes. I, I didn't know that and jesse by the way is jesse nor who uh does bacteria oh, files yes there you go all right i'm feeling kind of sleepy now <laughs> <laughs> let's do some picks yes. gotcha dixon you have a pick i do I do. So for those living in cloudy regions of the United States or anywhere throughout the world, we're passing through what turns out to be a remarkable uh, small particulate um, field that every year around this time, as we pass through it, some of them enter our atmosphere and light up the sky at night. So it's called the Perseid uh, Meteor Shower. And this year is supposed to be particularly good, I guess, because of the, of the abundance of particles per hour of watching. And uh, NASA's website has a solution. And that solution is if you've got a cloudy night and you can't get out or if you just want to watch from your television set, you can plug this website in and they have a live feed <laughs> <laughs> streaming live from probably Arizona or something like that. Uh, You get a clear view, sky view, and you can sit there and watch the meteor zip past your television screen. There's another solution. You can tune to the VHF, UHF frequencies and start calling CQ. Ah. (laughs) (laughs) Ham radio operators use this because as the the meteors come through the ionosphere, they leave an ionized trail. Oh, neat. 
And at the higher um, radio frequencies, yeah, you cool. can actually very briefly refract a signal off these for a few <laughs> seconds and make a contact with somebody, and, and people do this for fun. Oh, that's very cool. Are you going to be doing that? No, I'm not quite set up to do that. I, my antennas are, are, I don't have good antennas for those bands that would work for this, but I, I know a lot of people who are definitely into this. What's the weather looking like for you tonight? Uh, well, right at the moment, we're having a thunderstorm. Oh, right. So um, I'm not sure, not sure we'll have a clear view of the sky. Yeah. Last year when this happened, I was uh, in Sun River, Oregon. And at the uh, uh, Nature Center in Sun River, Oregon, uh, they have one of the largest collections of telescopes that the public uh, can uh, use uh, anywhere. <laughs> and they have, you know, uh, sky watching going on all the time. And so they had a special event for the meteor shower, and there were a whole bunch of people there. We were looking at constellations and watching the meteors, and the, and the space station went over. It was a hell of a night. It was great. <laughs> cool. But, and there's not a lot of light around, so it's a good sky. Love it. Well, since you're speaking, Rich, tell us what you have. So I I, I forget actually which link I put in here. Uh, <laughs> I put because I originally encountered this as I don't know on Facebook or something like that as some uh, science watch publication, uh, but then I wound up digging down to I don't know if it's the to a, the, the source. Okay, um, so that it that gives a better uh, description, uh, and the link that I put in here is the from the Molecular Information Systems Lab at the University of Washington. That's a it's a collaboration between the University of Washington and Microsoft Research, mm-hmm. our buddies at Microsoft Research, and basically this is. Uh, uh, well, it's a collaboration between MSR and University of Washington. As a matter of fact, this is a program at University of Washington, I believe, that I, I, I've heard of where they're, for many years now, they've had this program where they're uh, doing, people have, I, I assume this is an outgrowth of this program or part of this program, people get PhDs with two mentors, one who's a computer scientist and another who's a biologist, hmm. okay, to try and... Uh, uh, promote things like computational biology. At any rate, these guys are using, experimenting with using DNA for data storage. All right? Mm -hmm. Uh, And this uh, has been going on for a while, but it came up recently because, to read from this article, the uh, researchers have achieved a new milestone by encoding and retrieving a record high 200 megabytes of data on DNA, including a video by the band OK Go, (laughs) the the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in hundreds of languages, and more. And by the way, if you haven't seen the video by OK Go, which is their Rube Goldberg thing, it is a hoot. I think we may have even uh, had it as a twit pick pick. some some time ago. and they have a little uh, video here about how they do it. And basically, as you might imagine, uh, you can uh, encode binary information in the sequence of nucleotides on DNA. And these guys just have oligonucleotides made mm. uh, with uh, tags on them so that they can retrieve information by PCR. <laughs> okay. Uh, and then, of course, you decode the information by sequencing. So it's cumbersome at this point. Uh, but as we get better at making and storing DNA and sequencing it, it could, in fact, uh, be a reasonable uh, uh, way to store data. And they're working on it. They say that they can the, – the real advantage here is the compactness and the longevity. They say they have a raw limit of one exabyte per cubic millimeter of DNA. Right. And an exabyte is one billion gigabytes. <laughs> so they yeah. calculate that you could put the whole internet in a shoebox. <laughs> this right. is incredible. Let's get a Drobo with DNA. <laughs> with <laughs> DNA, yes. So imagine the library. They go to the library and they hand you a culture plate. <laughs> I assume, and you go to the. Uh, so they have four bases, uh, Rich. How do they make it binary? They just make them uh, redundant? I don't know. Mm. Okay. I, I don't know how, how the code is done. In fact, if you 
dig back through this, you find that one of the original papers on this was from George Church's lab. Yeah, <laughs> great. Um, uh, but I, uh, you can look at the video here. They they don't tell you exactly how they uh, make it. Uh, how they well, make could, it binary. Yeah, you could do something like an AT pair as a zero and a GC pair as a one, Some, something like something that. Like that. Mm -hmm. I, um, uh, so, oh, yeah, the other advantage of this, uh, or that they're touting, is that uh, DNA is stable and can be, right. depending on how you do it, I wonder if ultimately they would put this in some organism, I don't know, or just keep it around in their shoebox. Uh, but it'll stick around for thousands of years, whereas other data storage advices, devices that we have now degrade over time. Hmm. So there you go. Yeah, they just have to figure out, figure out how to read it um, more efficiently, more efficiently yeah. then. But I'm right. sure that things will but, develop. Well, people are already working on that for other reasons. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it would be fantastic to see what would happen to, let's say, a song that you put on, or stored it on DNA and then insert the plasmid into a bacteria and watch the mutation rate and listen to the song, how it changes. Well, yeah. and actually worked, listen to mutations. That's uh, part of what George Church's uh, uh, article was about, is that uh, because methods for handling <laughs> DNA are not 100% um, accurate, right. uh, uh, that you need to be concerned about introducing mutations. <laughs> exactly. Because, uh, things well, get messed up. although a uh, little appreciated fact, methods for handling digital data are not perfect either. <laughs> okay. If you save a JPEG image, for example, and yeah. it's a compressed format, yeah, you're gonna lose and then you open it and you close it and you save it someplace else, you've okay. just degraded the image. That's right. And if you keep copying it, you will eventually degrade it until there's no image there. Yep. So. It's pretty cool. I like that. Nothing is forever, Alan. <laughs> no. <laughs> Alan, what do you have? I have uh, another space pick. Um, this one is a, the story of something that happened back in yeah. May of 1967 when um, folks sitting around at, uh, at NORAD headquarters, responsible for defending us from incoming Soviet missiles, suddenly noticed that all of their radar was being jammed. <laughs> <laughs> and they were getting, you know, just static on it on all their radar units. And they freaked out a little bit because this is something that you might expect if the Soviet Union was going to start firing their missiles. One of the things you might do is try and jam your enemy's radar. Um, fortunately, they had just started a program in the Air Force to monitor sunspots because they knew this was related to things like radio propagation. And they quickly determined that what had happened was there'd been a solar storm that had uh, uh, sent a large number of charged particles into the Earth's atmosphere, and we were getting aurora borealis way south. Um, and this was one of the worst um, solar storms in modern history. Uh, as a result of this incident and the fact that if they hadn't had this program monitoring space weather, they might actually have started, you know, taking preemptive action, i.e. scrambling the jets, um, they decided, gee, we really ought to keep this around. We should keep <laughs> observing the sun. And so NASA and the Air Force have been um, collaborating to some extent, and, but it's, it's largely a DOD project to monitor space weather to continue uh, keeping track of the sunspot cycle and the effect that that has on our, on our ionosphere and auroras and things like that. And that has produced mm -hmm. an enormous amount of good science. So are the disturbances that are produced, are they mainly from the sun or are there other sources as well? Mainly from the sun. Huh. Um, so there's a constant stream of, um, of particles and energy, obviously coming from the sun to the earth, the earth's magnetic field deflects that, and that creates um, a lot of the phenomena like the northern lights that we associate with this. Mm -hmm. um, and the sunspots go through cycles. They rise and fall. They increase and decrease over um, an 11-year cycle. So right now we're in the down phase of a, sun, of a solar cycle, but you can also get things like um, uh, solar flares mm -hmm. that, uh, that will send 
massive amounts of material jetting toward Earth. Um, <laughs> these can bring the auroras very far south. They wreak havoc on a lot of electronic systems. Um, the GPS system has to be constantly monitored for problems that can arise if you get large amounts of, of solar flare activity. Um, mm. So it's a, it's a very important phenomenon that, um, that we keep track of now because of partly because of this incident that occurred in 1967 which has now been declassified and there's a paper out describing exactly Indeed. what happened it's cool this photo is awesome with that yeah. flare yeah, coming dude. out whoa that's yeah, the other I thing mean, what, that's come out of what, this monitoring wow what, what's happening <laughs> you know that yeah so that's a that's a the surface of the sun is this boiling gas you know there's this huge fusion reactor going on there and it it sends up bubbles and flares on the surface. And these, just to put this in perspective, that flare that you're looking at in that photo is probably, probably a few times the size of earth. Yeah. Right. Okay. So this Are thing you is kidding. Massive, That's huge. That's big, much bigger than earth. And, and the flare, this, just the flare Dixon. I know just the flare. Just the flare. If you put the earth flare. next to that, it would be a little dot. It would be yeah. the dot in the middle of the flare. Yeah. So the flare jets out from the surface and the reason it curves like that is because the gu the sun has so much gravity right that it's pulling it back in it's pulling the debris from the flare explosion back in but the energy from it is still going to jet out <laughs> and if that happens to be facing toward the earth then that energy is going to come exactly. and slam into our ionosphere exactly. and give you all these these neat effects uh, in yeah. fact here is a picture on the internet of a flare with a little tiny earth in the middle of it. Oh, Correct. Good. There you go. Yeah, no, that's... Uh, oh, look at this. I'll stick it in there. It's Turn a teensy, tiny teensy. Oh, my goodness. Yes. This is awesome. You know, this thing. Where, the, let me the reason you. why I know this is because all of the light coming from the sun <laughs> that hits the earth is, is exactly parallel. Because the yes, curvature yeah. of the sun is so minuscule compared to the diameter of the earth right. that all of the light that's coming in is polar. It's, wow. it's, it's all color illumination. Wow. Which is actually how the, uh, I guess, the ancient Greeks first came up with a measurement for the diameter of the Earth. Here, here. Wow. This is amazing. Here, here. Well, this is a second only to viruses. Yeah, there's only one other thing I wanted to add <laughs> to this one, and that is we all live in the biggest fear, and that is a gamma ray burst close yes. by. What the hell is a gamma ray well, burst? Well, if that happens, <laughs> well, we're just finding out about them now. And uh, it has so much energy. They used to call them quasars, but uh, they're not. They're, they're, they're destructive forces. I think one of the hypotheses is, Alan, correct me if I'm wrong, please, that is these are the fusion of two black holes. It's, I, I think I've heard that, too. I haven't followed that. Because uh, half of the stars but, out there are binary stars. Right. So they could collapse into black holes more frequently than single stars. And as a result, you could have orbiting black holes. Right. And then they attract each other, of course, and self-destruct or something happens to them. And out comes all this gamma radiation, which is highly destructive. Yes. Mm. Neat. They, can, they typically emit 1 times 10 to the 20 joules of energy, but can emit yes. up to 1 times 10 to the 25th. Exactly. The, yes. latter, the latter equivalent yeah. equivalent to 1 billion megatons of TNT. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and you thought Star Trek was, you know, you know, maybe that's the energy they're using to travel between various, who knows. It's that's awesome. It's awesome. awesome stuff. Yeah. And, and by the way, online, you can go to the solar telescope and you can watch yes. all of these things evolve and you get these twisted magnetic fields that often result in these ejecta. And Dixon, one thing we can say, yes. there are no viruses on the sun. There are no viruses no, on the sun. I'm pretty comfortable in saying that. But do you know what there is on the sun that you would never have guessed? What? Water. Okay. There's well, a you, have, you have a lot of hydrogen. And you do? Hydrogen. That you mean dihydrogen, dihydrogen monoxide? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, they do have water on Okay. My pick is a book by Elio Schechter. It's called In the Company of Microbes. Oh. Ten years of small things considered. He's put together, I don't know, a certain number of blog posts from his, uh, his blog, Small Things Considered, into a little book. And uh, it's illustrated by his daughter, Judith That's Schechter. Hard. He's very proud of it. He said to me, First time I've done anything uh, professional with my daughter. It's so cool. 
It's very neat. <laughs> Cute little doodles uh, oh, nice. of cells and so forth. So yeah. check it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Published by the American Society for Microbiology. We have a couple of listener picks. Neva writes, Hi, Twiv, and all your other wonderful related podcasts. Many listeners will send this pick, I'm sure. Just began reading <laughs> Ed Young's new book, I Contain Multitudes, The Microbes Within <laughs> Us and a Grander View of Life. And, of course, if you go to the page uh, where I have linked in the company of microbes down below, recommended for you customers who bought yep. this, also bought I Contain Multitudes. Boy, he's been getting a lot of press. Hmm. Oh, my gosh. He's been on every show, wow. uh, science show. So hope he sells a lot of books. That's great. Yeah. He's a great science writer, of course, from the UK. Nice. Cool book. Very best regards. Neva in Buda, Texas. Amanda writes, greetings, Twivom from Regina, Saskatchewan. 28C, 82.4F today and not a cloud in the sky. Mm. Check out this site, American Gut. <laughs> they have different levels of microbiome characterization that you can purchase from a simple characterization of your own stool or skin or spit at $99. Your family of four, even pets if you want, at $320. <laughs> Full sequencing of one or more of your bacteria or even your virome, 2500 bucks. So, I'll be ordering my basic kit today, but my virome will have to wait until my bank account can support it. <laughs> Amanda is a PhD in the government of Saskatchewan. She's director of virology at the Saskatchewan Disease Control Laboratory. Nice. I'm really glad to hear that you're listening to TWIV. Absolutely. Cool. Yes. Now, here is the question. Why is the virome 2500 bucks and <laughs> the microbiome is 99 bucks? Hmm. Doom, Hard, doom, harder doom. to sequence. Got to sequence the whole bloody Almost the whole bloody genome of the uh, virus, uh, yeah. yeah. And the bacteria, just 18S, ribosomal yeah. DNA, yeah. Right, it's the difference between a between a ribosomal and a uh, metagenomic experiment. Yep. Wow. I would love to have my virome sequenced. Huh. Which part of me would I do it for? Hmm. 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 I would like my liver virome. Oops, can't do it. <laughs> yeah. Got to get a biopsy. I guess uh, mouth or... Fecal, uh, uh, I would love it, but twenty five hundred bucks, too much. You could do it yourself. Yeah, I could do it myself for a lot less. Of course, do it for a thousand bucks. Come on, you're a virologist. I'm a virologist. Would I you, am. Would you do mine? Would you do mine too, please? <laughs> yeah, sure. I am a virologist. Yeah, you're I right, Dixon. I am. A I can say that. It could be an, I'm a virologist. You can find Twiv at iTunes microbe.tv slash Twiv. Please send your questions and comments to us. Twiv at microbe. TV, and consider supporting the science shows of microbe.tv at microbe.tv slash contribute. Dixon de Pommier is at verticalfarm.com. Thank you, Dixon. I had a great time. I'm glad. Is that the first time you've had a great time on No, Twitter? I have wonderful times on this show. Every time? Not every time. Sometimes. But always pleasant. It's bad? No, no, no. Never bad. Sometimes I don't get the nuance of what's going yeah, on. Yeah, but you're a plant guy, so you got it today, a right? Plant guy. <laughs> Aren't you a plant guy? <laughs> well, I like plants. <laughs> you're the father of the vertical farm. Come yeah, that on. That doesn't mean I'm a plant guy, though. I mean, I'm oh, boy, that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> Rich Condit is an emeritus professor at the University of Florida in Gainesville. Thank you, Rich. Sure enough, always a good time. Alan Dove is at alandove.com. You can also find him on Twitter. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. And I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the sponsors of today's show, Curiosity Stream and Drobo. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>